Welcome, you're listening to Business in Vancouver, and this podcast episode is sponsored by Admare Bio Innovations. Late last year, the Admare Institute released a white paper, in fact, its first white paper, and it looked at Canada's evolving life sciences industry. More specifically, it examined life sciences ecosystems, clusters, and the role of anchor companies. One of the findings of the report is that Canada currently has zero life sciences anchor companies. And as we'll discuss today, that matters quite a lot for a number of important reasons. Gordon McCauley is president and CEO of Admare Bioinnovations, and he joins me now with more. Gordon, great to have you on the show, and thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. Delighted to be here. First off, tell us a bit about why it was important to create the Admare Institute and what the purpose of the Institute is. Well, let me start with Admari first. I mean, we are a national organization that focuses on doing three things. We build companies, we build ecosystems, and we build talent. And that means that we're kind of at the intersection of uh, private industry, venture capital investors, academic investigators, research institutes, and public policymakers. So we have a really unique perspective on a bunch of issues in that space. And one of the things we realized is that there are a couple of public policy issues where we we need to have a common language. We need to understand what the basic definitions are what does the academic literature or the business literature tell us about issues and really just level set, if you will, so that we could have a really productive discussion around the country about what the, what the directional issues are for, for going forward. So that was really the idea behind uh, creating the Admari Institute and, and focusing on a handful of important issues. That makes a lot of sense. And why focus on anchor companies for your first white paper? So it's a great example of what I just tried to describe, right? It's it's an area where we need to understand what do we mean when we talk about an ecosystem? What do we mean when we talk about a about a cluster? And what's the difference between ecosystems and clusters? And everybody likes to talk about anchor companies. What does that really mean? Let's provide a common definition so that we know what the goal uh, we're all pursuing looks like. So it's it's a and it turns out an incredibly important issue for the long-term sustainability and success of the life sciences industry in Canada. Right. So let's start with that definition. Based on the research that you've done, what truly defines an anchor company and why does the presence of an anchor company matter? If I may, let me just back up and say, let's start with what's the definition of an ecosystem? Because sure. an ecosystem includes a whole bunch of really important component parts from a life sciences perspective. That includes high quality research institutes, high quality uh, universities. It includes the talent to be doing that research. It includes the uh, companies, uh, biotechnology companies, pharma companies, and others that develop and are ultimately the receptors of a lot of that commercial activity. It includes venture capital investors and, of course, public policymakers. One of the things that is interesting about ecosystems when you think about them is that they are synthetically created. They're the function of uh, all of those organizations coming together and deciding they want to be more than the sum of their parts. And, and the more is becoming a cluster. And in the academic literature, this is work that Michael Porter did uh, famously 25 years ago on cluster theory. And the difference between an ecosystem and a cluster is the presence of an anchor company. And the reason that's important is that an anchor company and a cluster, therefore, is uh, driven by market forces and has a much higher likelihood of long-term Success. So it's a really important kind of uh, foundation to build on. So coming to your question, what is an anchor company? Well, if you, if you rely on Porter's work, uh, it tells you that it's, it's an organization with a few hundred million dollars at least of commercial revenue, not uh, partnership revenue or uh, venture capital investment, but but revenue generated from the marketplace itself. It probably has about 500 employees. It has uh, relationships ar around the world. It is uh, an active builder and developer of talent. And, and one of the things you see is uh, other organizations get spun off from 
from that anchor organization. The reason that you care, Haley, is that literally everything you care about in economic development terms is better in the presence of an anchor company. You have better capital formation, better capital attraction, better talent uh, attraction and talent mobility. You have better translation of commercial potential from academia or research institutes to um, business activity. So as I say, literally everything you care about is better in the presence of an anchor company. So we want anchor companies in probably a variety of sectors, but certainly life sciences. Why do we not have any anchor companies here yet in Canada? Well, the reality is we have had anchor companies in Canada, and they're really good examples historically of what uh, what role they can play. So if you think in the in the Vancouver community, uh, we all remember QLT as a as a great example of an anchor company originally Quadrologics that was uh, in its time one of the most successful and profitable biotechnology companies in the world. And all of those things that I described about an anchor company happened with QLT. And in fact, today, if you go through the, the bio, uh, biotech community in Vancouver, you can, you can trace the family roots, uh, in almost every circumstance back to QLT or at least one, maybe two degrees of separation from QLT. The same is true in Montreal. By the way, uh, if you look at uh, Biochem Pharma, which uh, uh, came to prominence in the uh, 90s with the first uh, uh, efficacious therapy in AIDS called AZT, um, it was dramatically successful in that uh, community in exactly the same way. And again, today, you can tra- trace the, the, the family roots back. And when you look in our organization, we have 140 people roughly divided between Vancouver and Montreal. And, and it's certainly true within our organization. There's one or two degrees of separation to QLT or Biochem Pharma, uh, within the organization. So then, your next question is going to be, okay, what happened? And, and a, and a couple of unfortunate things happened. One beyond our control, uh, and that is the economic crisis of uh, 2008 that kind of freezed all of the capital markets in the, in the economy in general, but really froze for high risk things like, uh, like biotech. And also, unfortunately, some of those companies made uh, uh, decisions as as they tried to grow that that prevented them from growing. And ultimately, they were all uh, sold. So um, QLT, probably a, a less successful sale, sadly. Uh, Biochem was sold for billions of dollars. And it's true of other organizations. Uh, Anermed here is, a, is another good example. So that meant that we find ourselves in the sort of 2017, 2018 period in a, in a situation where the learned behavior of entrepreneurs has been, how do I just do so much as opposed to thinking about creating an anchor company over time? A number of, of folks, myself certainly included, have been advocating for thinking differently about anchor companies. And, and I'm really excited that that uh, seems to be catching fire and, and we find ourselves in a very different situation today. Again, in Vancouver, uh, look at, at Xenon, which is, uh, uh, wildly successful and rapidly moving down the path with a phase three study and, and, and really exciting data. Or look at Abcelera, which was such an important player in the, uh, um, in the COVID-19 crisis and, and use that to demonstrate the platform value of, of, of what they can do or look at other organizations uh, in the ecosystem like uh, younger ones like Gandiva and others. Uh, uh, Precision Nanosystems was a great example. Aspect Biosystems is a spectacular example of an organization that could be a uh, could be an anchor player. And the same is true in, in, in Montreal, by the way. So so the answer is we can absolutely have them. It's a decision that we need to take that we want to have them. Interesting. And so let's assume everybody wants to have them, given some of the great economic benefits you've outlined. What are the next steps? How do we think about creating or supporting the creation of anchor companies here in our backyard? The first thing I would say is that um, our one of the things that our white paper says very clearly 
is that being an anchor company is a state of mind. You need to decide early that you want to do it. And while it's tempting to disregard that and say, well, how is a, as a, an emerging company, a new startup supposed to think about being an anchor company? When you actually step back and analyze it, Haley, the only downside to thinking that way is that you create more value. What I mean is, let's be honest, the, the most likely outcome in a lot of biotechnology companies is some sort of M&A activity, which is a good thing. I'll come back to that in a minute. But when you think about, you, you can't plan for M&A. Right. It, it involves a whole bunch of externalities that you can't involve. Instead, if you decide from the outset that you're going to think about the marketplace and you're going to think about all the things that you need to do to make your company ready for the marketplace at the end of all of that uh, human clinical trial process. If M and A happens along the way, all you've done is made yourself more valuable. So the first step in answer to your question is you got to think like an anchor company and you have to do that from the start. That's very interesting. Anecdotally, we hear the narrative of Canada tends to think small. The U.S. tends to think big with big moonshot ideas. You also sometimes hear this narrative of Canadian companies that are showing success as startups or scale ups getting acquired and that IP and that talent then flows south. So it sounds like what I'm taking away is you need to almost commit to not taking an early exit of that kind. You need leaders and investors and stakeholders to commit to growing a company to that anchor level and not having it leave the country in some way, shape or form down that path. I, I, I'm not sure I'm prepared to agree entirely with what you're saying. Let me, the first part, I agree completely. We need to think differently and think bigger and think in an un-Canadian fashion. And, and this isn't just about Canada and the U.S. This is about a global marketplace. And one of the things that's important to recognize, because a lot of people you know, by the way, say, well, it has the, the fact that we don't have anchor companies here has to do with the proximity to the U.S. market. And that's just not true. And the best demonstration that it's not true is to know that Canada is the only advanced pharma market in the world without a research-based anchor company. So if you want to tell me that it's something unique about being Canada beside the United States, you need to explain Belgium to me or any one of a, a number of other countries where it just doesn't necessarily make market sense that they'd be there. The second part of your question, I think we've got to be careful with, though. At the end of the day, uh, these businesses are capital intensive. We know that. We know that no company is likely to be successful without global capital participating. So economic decisions will out, right? Economic equations will win the day at the, at the end of, end of the discussion. That said, uh, when you're, Again, when you're thinking like an anchor company and you're thinking about building an infrastructure somewhere, uh, it's pretty interesting the compelling value you can create uh, locally. You know, if, if you look at, at Amgen, for example, which has a substantive presence in British Columbia, the reason that presence is here is uh, entrepreneurs who created that business, uh, John Babcock is his name. He's been a partner of ours in a number of, of uh, businesses since. John decided he wanted that business to stay in British Columbia and convinced through a number of, of transactions those investors to keep the business here because of the quality of the work they were doing, because of the quality of the people who were working there. So yes, it is uh, a situation where we need to think globally and think in a kind of un-Canadian fashion. It's also the case that we need to recognize M&A happens and that's a good thing. Now, let me let me just keep going there for a second, if you'll let me. There, there are two great examples in the past year that were really good things for our organization. Uh, a company in Montreal called Bellis Health, which um, it, it, you can trace its route back to Biochem Pharma, by the way, uh, and where uh, we uh, licensed to them some technology that we'd been developing, and they did an extraordinary job of advancing that through human clinical trials into a pivotal phase three trial and they sold the company to uh, GSK last year 
for $2.6 billion Canadian. What's interesting about that, Haley, is that, first of all, a bunch of people there made money that they now want to reinvest and recycle into the ecosystem. Secondly, that we have a, a cadre of of leaders who've been involved in that business, who learned how to get there and know now some of the things they need to do. And they're trying to, to, to repeat again. And that's the, that's the essence of, of that, uh, uh, anchor company kind of behavior. And, and by the way, uh, Roberto Blini, the CEO of that company was thinking like an anchor along the way and ended up actually creating more value in, in the process. Another example, uh, also a Montreal company that uh, where we were founding shareholders called Inversago, which uh, sold for $1.3 billion Canadian. Again, all of the players there are now actively thinking about how do we, how do we re-engage and do it again? That's, that's the value that sort of the, the, for lack of, it's, it almost sounds derogatory, but the rinse and repeat value of, of M&A in that space, it works out very nicely. Absolutely. In thinking about the anchor company mindset, is this a mindset that also needs to be embraced by policymakers, by decision makers at um, venture capital firms or other sources of capital here at home? A hundred percent, yes. And I am pretty comfortable saying that uh, the 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 key venture capital players in Canadian life sciences all would agree a hundred percent that the primary objective should be creating um, anchor companies again because I think they would endorse that notion of even if you get bought along the way you are going to have created more value and I think public policymakers agree I, I know for example the, the 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 deputy minister of industry science and economic development or innovation science and economic development in Ottawa um, is is a a passionate advocate for the need for anchor companies in a number of sectors and certainly life science so absolutely yes is the answer to your question. And so in thinking, looking through the available literature and data, have you been able to identify how best to align policy and investment strategy to support the creation of more anchor companies here in Canada? So there, there are a number of things that we can do, but we have to start from a very clear recognition that this is a market activity. This is something that business people need to do. Uh, and And in particular, one of the dangerous things that's been demonstrated a number of times around the world, when public policymakers try to protect anchors, all they end up doing is weakening. And, and when you think about it, it makes sense because anchors, as I, from where I started, they're a function of market activity. And so if you take out some of that competitive pressure, it's quite logical that you end up weakening that organization. So let's start from a, from a, from a physician perspective. First, do no harm. Don't try and protect them. Try and encourage them. What can be done? I, th I think there are a number of things that public policymakers can do to help with that process. Uh, I think uh, capital investment is a really important area where uh, Canada is underserved in terms of the venture capital activity in this space. There's been a lot of discussion over the course of the last couple of months about the role that pension funds could play in this space. And, and, and let me quickly say, I don't think anybody would rationally argue you should force pension funds to do anything other than seek the best return they can. Having said that, it is somewhat bizarre that a number of the major Canadian pension funds are more exposed to uh, the economy in China than they are to the Canadian economy. And so I don't think it's really going a long way to say, we're happy to be sector agnostic. We're happy to to uh, encourage you to make the best economic decisions you can. But maybe we should ask you to invest a little bit more in Canada. I think there's some real potential in that space to create uh, increased capital in this uh, in this space. At this point in time, are there enough folks in or adjacent to the life sciences ecosystem in Canada who have embraced this anchor company mindset? Are we on track to maybe get to that place where we once again have an anchor company in that sector? Absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, one of the most encouraging things for us as an organization was to see how positively this report has been received by our colleagues within the industry. 
Uh, and I think if you just compare the situation, say five years ago to today, Haley, it's dramatically different when you look at the list of companies that are prospective anchors. They're not all going to get there. We all, we all know that. But the number of prospective anchors, I'm pretty sure if I asked that question five years ago, the answer would have been three or four. And today, I think the answer is probably 15 or 20, something like that. And I think there's another probably double that number. So 30 to, to, to 40 who are thinking about being an anchor, thinking about doing the kinds, the kinds of things. Let, let me, let me give you a great example. The company in uh, in Montreal called Repair Therapeutics, which doesn't mean the def- meet the definition of being an anchor today, but it's thinking like an anchor and it's doing all the things that are necessary to um, build that kind of long term uh, market value. Coming back to British Columbia again, I mean, I mean, Xenon is is obviously the closest to meeting that definition. I think Abcelera is obviously thinking like an anchor and behaving that way. Uh, again, Aspect I think is a is a spectacular company that is uh, thinking like an anchor and is, and is on the way to to being there. So we are in a dramatically better situation today than we were even five years ago. So I'm 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 personally very excited about the progress we've made and. What we should be seeing over the next five years. Fantastic. And before I let you go, Gordon, what else can we expect from the Edmari Institute in the months and years to come? Well, we'll see. I mean, the the uh, challenge for us is to ask others what ideas they have for similar issues where we can apply that kind of of uh, level setting, if you will. And, and and we think there are a handful of others, but we'd really like ideas from the uh, from the marketplace because. You know, we, we do find ourselves in a unique situation, uh, between, as I think I said earlier, between industry and capital and public policy makers and academia, where we can really pull all those pieces together. Uh, so we're, we're certainly open to ideas and, and you can expect to, to see one, uh, in the second half of, of 2024. Fantastic. I look forward to reading that. And in the meantime, Gordon, thank you so much for coming onto our show to talk about your first white paper. Hey, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Gordon McCauley is president and CEO of Edmari Bio Innovations. They last year launched the Edmari Institute. I highly encourage anyone to go and find the white paper we've been discussing for more insight. It's quite the document with a lot of great insights in it. I'm Haley Wooden-Hastings, editor-in-chief of Business in Vancouver. Thank you so much for listening.